What do you know about connections between Mormonism and the occult? Well, um, as I said before, we were told, of course, that the head of the Mormon Church, the founder of the Mormon Church, Joseph Smith, was a sorcerer. And later on, after I got out of the Mormon Church and got born again, um, we discovered that indeed that was the case. Um, even Mormon historians, professors at Brigham Young University, have learned that Joseph has practiced sorcery, he tried to raise the dead, he practiced necromancy, uh, he even when he was shot, he had a Jupiter talisman in his pocket, which was intended to give him worldly power and success with women. And of course at the time of his death, I think he had 27 wives, so obviously it was working pretty well. Uh, beyond that, um, I have no reason to believe that things have changed over the years. Um, because the throughout the church, various even like the, when they built the Salt Lake Temple, it's full of occult symbols. It was set up according to astrology. Um, we've had people tell us that, that various Mormon leaders are into the occult. In fact, Mormons generally are very into the occult. I mean, it's 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 rife within the church, even though the church has an official position against it. So there's heavy connections between Mormonism and the occult right from its very foundation. Thank you. How much money do Mormons pay to the church? Well, there's a, if you're a devout Mormon, you're supposed to pay around 25% of your income, gross, to the church, which sounds like an awful lot of money, and it is. That's why the Mormon church is the richest church on earth. You're supposed to tithe, which is 10%. Most people are used to that. Uh, but then there's tithe offerings, pardon me, there's, there's fast offerings, there's welfare offerings, there's building funds, there's, you know, missionary funds. I mean, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Plus, you're supposed to, one day a month, you're supposed to fast and give all your money that you would have spent on food for that day to the Mormon Welfare Fund. So wow. it adds up to a fair amount of money. Yeah. They're sitting pretty, aren't they? <laughs> well, it's the richest church per capita in the world. Do you know of any stories that tell connections between non-humans and Mormons? Well, um, there's a lot of strange stuff that goes on underneath the Mormon temple and nearby the Mormon temple. The Mormon temple, of course, is right in the heart of Salt Lake and it has sub-basements upon sub-basements upon sub-basements. We've been in some of them. And um, it's uh, been reported that uh, right across, well, it's not been reported, it's a fact, <laughs> that right across from the Mormon temple is a downtown urban mall. Uh, I forget the name of it. And in the basement of the mall, numerous times the cleaning people have seen large reptilian figures walking on two legs, scurrying through the, scurrying through the basement of the mall. Um, also, 
um, one of the temples, actually the Seattle Bellevue, Washington Temple, when it was being built, some Christian colleagues of mine snuck into the found when they were building the foundation of the temple and put Bibles underneath the, the, pi the main pylons of the temple. And uh, they also put a little booklet called To Moriah With Love, which was one of the first and best anti-Mormon books ever written. And then they poured the concrete over the temple. So we, we used to joke about the fact that, that that temple was the only Mormon temple that was built on the Word of God. Then, you see, you got to realize temple dedication is a huge deal. The Mormon prophet himself flies in and prays this dedicatory prayer over the temple. And while he was doing that up on the hill overlooking the temple, there's all these pine trees. And hiding behind the pine trees were a dozen believers in Yeshua praying fiercely against the lying and deceitful spirits of Mormonism. So guess what happens? We found out later from several people who got born again that when people would go in, see, the Mormons believe that, that Almighty God himself walks in those temples. That's why they're so sacred. They believe that he's actually walking through the corridors, that he, he stays in the celestial room and visits his children that are there. And, you know, on and on and on. And many people in Mormon temples have experiences where they see dead ancestors. Like they'll go in and be baptized for their dead grandmother or something, and then they'll see old granny hovering up there in the ceiling saying, oh, thank you for finally, you know, baptizing me so I can join the one true church, you know, that kind of thing. And of course, all of these are demons. Well, so what was interesting about this Bellevue Temple is that people would start seeing these horrible crocodile, reptilian-like figures running through the hallways. Hmm. And it freaked several people out to the point they got born again. And what we believe is that the prayers uh, and the, the presence of the Bibles underneath the foundation was sort of scrambling these, you know, reptilians and demons or whatever they were from appearing as these benign relatives or as Heavenly Father or whatever. And so instead, the masks were being ripped off and they were being seen for what they really were. Wow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What is a Mormon patriarch? Well, that's another special office in the church that's usually only given to very venerable, holy, old guys that have you know, been in the church a long time. And they're given supposedly a special power to be like a medium, to be like a trance channeler. And one of the two things that you get once you get a temple recommend is you get to go to the temple and be married and sealed and all that. The other thing is you get to go and have a patriarchal blessing. And what they do, you go into this special room that's like double soundproof. The doors have baffles on them and everything. And when you, they close it, thunk, you know, and it's all sealed up. And then they have this tape recorder there. And you sit down in this chair, and both my wife and I went through this, and the patriarch lays his hands on you. And supposedly he has the keys from, you know, Heavenly Father to give you this blessing which basically reveals to you your lineage. Reveals to you that you know, every Mormon that goes through this is told that they are of the house of Ephraim, one of the twelve tribes of Israel. And then they're told something about supposedly what their mission is in life. And it's all like channeled through this old guy. And it's, it's all pretty, like both Sharon's and mine are, were, were pretty vague and nebulous and you know, kind of like the typical you mm -hmm. know, thing of medium, oh, you know, you're going to meet a tall, dark stranger or something like that, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, not quite that banal, but, and, and it's really, it's a kind of mediumship. But then you, the, then this is taped, and it's all highly confidential, like, I did not, unless Sharon shared it with me, I didn't even get to hear her thing unless she gave it to me. Uh, and then they type it up, someone transcribes this tape because they tape it. And then in a few weeks you're given that in a sealed envelope by registered mail. Wow. And it's a big deal. I mean, they're, oh, my patriarchal blessing was so wonderful, you know, and they're, you're going, they're gushing on and on about how great it is. And I thought, gee, this is just like what I used to get when I was a medium. Right. But, you know, everybody's got to have their thing. Right. Who is the prophet they believe will eventually return and rule over the USA? Well, the Brigham Young prophesied, and you see, every, they believe every head of the Mormon church is a prophet, seer, and revelator. But Brigham Young prophesied that, that at, the, at a certain point in America's history, because you've got to realize one of the 
kind of odd doctrines of Mormonism is that they believe that the, uh, the U.S. Constitution is an inspired document, just like the Bible and the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price. It's an inspired document. So they believe that sometime in America's history, the uh, Constitution will hang by a thread. And the elders of Israel, which means Mormon elders, because the Mormons believe they are Israel, and will come in and they will save the Constitution. And part of this salvation will be that, and this is Brigham Young's words, one mighty and strong will rise up, and he will be a mighty leader, and he will become both the President of the United States and the Mormon prophet simultaneously. And he will institute, in order to save the Constitution, he will institute a theocratic kingdom where he will rule as a benign dictator under the, of course, the aegis of Jesus Christ. That's pretty scary. Yes, well, I'll tell you what's even scarier, is that I had a friend of mine who was in the Secret Service who was a Mormon. Because you've got to realize, a lot of FBI, a lot of CIA, a lot of Secret Service are Mormons. And this fellow said to me, he said, it happened that our, our, our temple that we would go to when we were in Milwaukee was way off in Washington, D.C. At that time, in the early 80s, that was the closest temple. And it's the biggest, most expensive temple in the world. It cost $20 million in the 1970s to build. Big, beautiful, solid white marble thing. Scares the living daylights out of you when you see it at night. It looks like a UFO ready to take off. Anyway, it's got five stories. And um, you're, we're only allowed as faithful temple Mormons into four of those stories. And he told me, you know what's in the fifth story? I said, I have no idea. And he said, well, I know because I was involved in consulting in it. In the fifth story of that temple, which is in Silver Springs, Maryland, is an exact replica of the Oval Office. And over it, on the roof, and you can see this, if you, if you get an aerial photo of the temple, you'll see this mysterious dome on top of the temple. And what's under there is a whole array of like telemetry, radio signals, whatever they need, to communicate with the world from the White House. is The exact duplicate of it is on the roof of that building, and it's so powerful a set of instrumentation that they've had to reroute airplanes around the temple. They, they can't let airplanes fly over the temple like commercial airlines because it scrambles their avionics. Wow. And they believe, they with all their hearts, now, now most Mormons don't know about this little thing I just told you, but in a general sense, they believe that someday it's their destiny. And for years they were grooming Senator Orrin Hatch to be this. But he doesn't seem to be the one, you know, but because he's the only, well, I, I, he's the most prominent Mormon congressman. And they believe it with all their hearts that someday a Mormon will become president. And then he will rule, and you see, they will reinstitute the, what they call the United Order, which is a communistic system of government that they had originally in Utah before it became a state. And among other things, that will mean capital punishment for people like me. Because anybody who is not a, uh, who is an apostate Mormon has to be slain. That's part of the United Order. Really? Yes. It's wow. called blood atonement. That's why, for example, Utah and Idaho, and I think maybe Arizona, are the only states that have death by firing squad as part of their capital punishment. Why? Well, because according to Brigham Young, there are certain sins that can only be atoned, not by Yeshua's blood, but by your blood, because they're so grave and so heinous. And those five sins are murder, adultery, homosexuality, apostasy, which is what I did by leaving the church, or marrying a black person. Wow. Those are the five unpardonable sins. That if you die like a natural death of those sins, you will go straight into the outer darkness, which is the Mormon version of hell. So where do black people fit in this? Well, let me finish this thing and then we'll get okay. to that. Um, so, for example, now obviously the Mormon church no longer has the power to execute apostates because, you know, they don't run the state. Well, officially anyway, they don't run the state. Unofficially they do. Because I've had many people tell me when I was in Utah preaching that the church is like an 800-pound gorilla. You just try and stay out of its way. And they actually have a, they have a church security system that they, they arrest people. They have the power to arrest people within Utah. And they're, they're, they're like a church 
instrument, but they have arrest power. They, they can't throw people in jail, but they can haul them down to the police station. And in fact, one colleague of ours had that happen to them because they had some sensitive information on their computers that was damaging to the LDS church. And so the LDS security people came, most of their security people were former FBI, former Secret Service. And they came and arrested them, confiscated all their computers, never gave them back, took them down to police headquarters while they were doing that. The police let them go, but all their information was gone forever. Wow. So anyway, uh, like for example, if you commit a murder, you, you basically, if you're a faithful Mormon, you believe that the only way you're ever going to get out of the stripey hole is to, you know, be, have, you see, firing squad is the only form of execution that sheds blood. Hanging doesn't, lethal injection doesn't, an electric chair doesn't. All right. So that's why, for example, Gary Gilmore, I don't know if you ever heard of him, but Norman Mailer wrote a book about him called The Executioner's Song. Back in, I think, the 60s, he was a, he was a jack Mormon, which means a backslidden Mormon, who was a crook. He robbed a gas station, killed a guy. He was sent to death, and he asked for death by firing squad because he was enough of a Mormon that he felt that that would atone for his sin of murder. Now, as to the black people, see, for decades, from the foundation of the church in 1930 all the way up till the 1960s, Mormon prophets, one after the other, taught that no black man would ever receive the priesthood, that no black person would ever enter the temple, because here's what they believe. They are taught that in the pre-existence, see, they believe that all of us exist in the pre-existent state uh, as kind of angelic beings around the throne of Heavenly Father. And their, their, their early cosmology teaches that, um, that there was this council of the gods, and that Yeshua stood up as the eldest son of Heavenly Father, and he said, no wait, I think it was actually Lucifer that stood up first. Lucifer is the younger brother of Yeshua, okay. And he stood up and he said, we're going to create this world down here. That's the plan. And what I will do is I will go down there and I will force everyone to be good. I will, they will have no free will. They will all have to obey your commandments. And it will be a glorious place and I will get all the glory. And then Yeshua stood up and he proposed an alternate plan. He said that, that no, we will go and we will create this world, but we will give people free will so they can choose the good from the evil. And then I will go down at some point in human history and I will be the savior. And I will show the way and I will open the door into the celestial kingdom for people by revealing the keys of the priesthood. Then the council of the gods voted. And they voted down Lucifer's plan and they voted up Yeshua's plan. So Lucifer got all honked off, and he went off and started spreading, you know, malice and gossip among all these spirit children that were running around heaven, billions and billions of them, okay? And um, basically what happened was, a third of the angels, a third of these priests and spirits joined with Lucifer, and they fought against Heavenly Father and tried to take over heaven. A third of them joined with Heavenly Father, and fought against the angels and cast them out of heaven. Now, according to Mormon doctrine, those fallen pre-existent spirits became the demons. The people who fought with Yeshua and Heavenly Father were blessed that they, when they come to earth, they would have white and delightsome skin. There was another third, though, and they kind of sat on the sidelines and waited to see which group would win. And because of their failure to be zealous for the sake of the truth, they were cursed with a dark skin and they would become a loathsome, filthy people. These are the words, these are my words, these are the wow. words of the Mormon scriptures and the Mormon prophets. And so when they are born on earth, they are born in African, with African blood. They're oh, Asian too? Does no, 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 just African. Uh -huh. See, Mormons can marry Asians, that's fine. And of course, now, and here's what happened. Um, in the 1970s, uh, with the dawn of the civil rights movement in this country and so on, the IRS began to lean on the Mormon church and say, you can't be uh, a non-profit tax-exempt organization and have this discriminatory policy. 
that they would not let black men into their, any priesthood position, they would not let black people into their temples. So guess what happened? Mm -hmm. The Mormon prophet had a revelation. Spencer W. Kimball, mm -hmm. in 19, I think it was 1978, I could be wrong about that date, he had a revelation that now it's okay for black people to come into the temple. It's okay for black men to hold the priesthood. Isn't that just, doesn't that just bless your socks off? And is it okay for Mormons to marry black people? I don't know if that's true or not. No. I don't, I, I think it must be because they can't really not, say, but I think it would be extremely, highly, frowned upon. Right. So the funny thing is, is that Brigham Young, a hundred years earlier, taught that no black man will receive the priesthood until every white man on earth has received it. And that was a, a prophetic statement. Now, in a hundred years later, another Mormon prophet contradicts the previous Mormon prophet. Mm. Because if you want to hurt the Mormon church, hit them in their wallet. Yeah, right. The same thing happened a hundred years earlier with polygamy. Because the Mormons said they're going to fight for the principle. That's what they call it. Polygamy was the principle. They were going to fight for the principle of polygamy to the death. To the last man, the Mormon prophet in Utah was an idea. They actually had what was called the Mormon Wars, where the, the president sent in the U.S. Army to take over the, 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 the territory at that time. They wow. called it the territory of Deseret. And, and they said, we're going to confiscate all of your buildings, we're going to confiscate all of your chapels, all of your temples, we're going to confiscate all of your bank accounts. And that's when they said, okay, we have a revelation. <laughs> now we don't do polygamy anymore. I see. So you see, the Mormon, I tell people the Mormon God changes his mind more often than his underwear. Wow. Anyhow, so nowadays there's this kind of weird, uneasy thing where there, there are most of the black people that are Mormons are in Africa, where they don't know any of this. Where the reach of films like the God, because the God Makers movie exposed all of this. Uh, and but but there are a few black people in the Mormon Church, but they're they're so deceived because they don't realize they're in probably next to the Aryan nations, the most racist church on earth. What does the word Mormon mean? Well, actually, it's it's like a nickname for the uh, church. Um, coming from the Book of Mormon. But the funny thing is, is that there are meanings that are related to it in more sinister places. For example, uh, in China, the word, the word is Mormon means gates of hell. And so therefore, uh, Mormon missionaries try to not use that title. They just say, oh, we're from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, because otherwise it kind of freaks them out. Uh, the Chinese, that is. And the other interesting thing is, is that if you look in the Satanic Bible, and there are other sources for this as well in ancient uh, lexicons, the, um, there's a god of the dead, the god of ghouls. And of course, ghouls are beings that roam in cemeteries and feed off the corpses of the dead. And there's the god of the ghouls is named Mormo. Now, what would a person who worshipped Mormo be called? A Mormon. Mm. And what's interesting is, is that, as you may realize, Mormons are obsessed with the dead. Mm. In a sense, they're feeding off the dead because they're doing all this genealogy. They're running all over the world, looking in cemeteries, trying to find the names of, of ancestral people and ultimately, you know, get every person who's ever lived baptized in the Mormon church. So, actually, the word Mormon is not a very innocent name. Mm. Interesting. What can you tell us about Mormon temple architecture? Well, that's interesting because there's this book that's maybe 20 years old now, a beautiful like coffee table book called Salt Lake Temple, A Monument to a People. And in there, it says that the Salt Lake Temple architecture is a physical expression of Mormon theology. Well, in our book, Whited Sepulchres, uh, Jim Spencer and I very clearly show that all over the Mormon temple, are Masonic witchcraft and occult symbols. Just to give you the most obvious example, all over most of the older Mormon temples, like the one in St. George and uh, Salt Lake and so on, you will find dozens of inverted pentagrams. Now, as you've already established, inverted pentagrams are the symbol of Satanism, the five-pointed star upside down. And this is what is used to bring the kingdom of, of Satan into manifestation. And yet there's no crosses anywhere on a Mormon temple or a Mormon wow. meeting house. Wow.
So we feel that, uh, to be brief, I mean, it's a very complicated subject, and basically the, everything about the Mormon temp temple architecture reveals that the roots of Mormonism are in the occult and in Lucifer worship, not in the Bible. Mm, thank you. In your book, uh, Mormonism's Temple of Doom, you show that at the time you published that, there was an approximately 85% similarity between the rituals of masonry and the rituals of Mormonism, and also a great resemblance between Mormon rituals and satanic rituals. So what changes has the Mormon Church made since you published that book? Well, they have gotten rid, and of course I haven't been in the temple since then because I'm no longer a Mormon, but I've been told by people that have that they, they've gotten rid of some of what are called the penal signs, which are where you, you, like you mind having your throat cut and things like that, which are very Masonic. Also, there's this whole section, it's quite lengthy, where they have a, what is obviously a Protestant minister wearing like a, a Geneva gown, you know, kind of like you might see Norman Vincent Peale wear or Robert Schuller wear. And, uh, and basically being a lackey of the devil. He's being portrayed as a lackey of the devil. And he teaches Adam and Eve orthodox theology, in other words, the theology of the normal Christian religion. And then he's portrayed as, as a, basically a puppet of the devil. They got rid of that. They also got rid of the infamous pay, lay, ale thing, which is at the end of, toward the end of the ceremony, they're taught this one sign, which is where they stand and they go like, pay, lay, ale. Pay lay ale, pay lay ale. Oh, no, they're not talking about a beer. <laughs> uh, it's it. That's supposed to be in the ancient Adamic language. It's supposed to mean, "Oh God, hear the words of my mouth." But what it actually means in Hebrew is marvelous false god. And so that's what they're crying out. Mm. And when we and several others pointed that out. Uh, ours was kind of the book that was the coup de grace. They uh, ended up basically changing the temple ritual quite substantially. Hmm, interesting. They also got rid of the oaths. It used to be they had oaths where one of the oaths you took is that you would swear that you would never cease to call down curses upon the government of the United States of America. What? Mm -hmm. Because, see, the Mormon church was very upset with the fact that the they, that the government of the United States allowed Joseph Smith to be murdered, and that the government of the United States um, came in to Utah with basically the army and essentially took over the state and forced the Mormons to give up polygamy. And so for two generations, they were having everybody in their temple, including some of the living Mormons that are in the highest levels of the church today, swear that every day they would call down curses upon the government of the United States. Wow. So isn't that a real patriotic, nice, all-American church? And loving. Oh, very loving, too, yes. Mm. You said earlier that the Mormon church has an, a goal to eventually set up a dictatorship. So how dangerous is the Church of Mormon? Well, I'd say in some respects it's even more dangerous than some of these more sinister-sounding groups, partially because they just look so, they look so nice and wholesome. I mean... Who would respect? Who would suspect? You know these pink cheek boys bicycling down the street in their nice suits and ties and clean cut, cut haircuts. And of course they're they're nice people. But but the goals of the church are are in fact a benevolent dictatorship. And not only that, they have as part of their doctrine, which they still enforce to this day, certain very sinister practices. Um, there's the belief that if you're an apostate, your your blood can only your own shed blood can atone for your sins. There's the fact that, that even to this day, Mormons who leave the church upon occasion are killed. And myself and several other people who are prominent ex-Mormons have had attempts on our lives. What happened? Um, well, I've been shot at. Uh, I, and I mean, I can't blame all of this on the Mormons. Some of it might be the Masons or the Satanists or whatever. But I know for a fact in one case, I was in the hospital and a nurse came in who actually, you can kind of tell when they wear temple garments. Because <laughs> it, it to, just like regular underwear sort of shows up a little bit, especially if you're wearing a white nurse's uniform. And she put some kind of contact poison on my forehead. And if Sharon who was sleeping in a chair beside my bed hadn't kind of woken up, she probably would have put a lot more on. And um, 
So things like that, and and other people I know have had had poison put in their food, and uh, have have been shot at, and been chased down the road by trucks full of Mormons with axes and shotguns. Mm. You know, things like that. I mean, these people, especially when they think they're in the majority, see they'll behave themselves when they're in a Gentile state like you know Florida or something. But out in Utah and Idaho and and Nevada, where they're in the majority. They they tend to be a little bit more pugnacious, and uh, plus they they um, you know they will just try and intimidate you. And if that doesn't work, they'll use violence sometimes. Now I'm not saying this happens all the time, but it does happen, and it's right in the doctrine of the church. This blood atonement thing. Mm -hmm. And of course, if they have a benevolent dictatorship, then it's very easy for someone to decide that they'll change it into a non-benevolent dictatorship well, down the track. And yes, here's the, but here's the, here's, the, here's the mind game you play. See, if you think, oh, this poor Bill Stublin, he's rejected the temple, he's rejected his oaths and covenants, he had all that light, he's doomed to go into the outer darkness, it would be a benevolent thing mm. to cut his throat and uh -huh. his blood spill out upon the earth so that his sin, soul might ascend to heaven. Right. Kind of like the Inquisition. Yes, something like that. Hmm. Who were the Danites? Well, the Danites were a group that was started by uh, Joseph Smith out in, I think it was either Missouri or Ohio, and they were like kind of a sort of Mormon version of the Ku Klux Klan. And they were in full force by the time we got to Nauvoo, Illinois, which was the last outpost of Mormonism in the eastern half of the U.S. They were writers who would go out at night with hoods on, not white hoods, of course, but just black hoods or whatever, to disguise their faces. And they would, they would like ride to the places of people who were either opposing the Mormons or maybe people who were apostatizing from the Mormon church trying to leave it. And they would, you know, rough them up or even in the case of apostates, they'd cut their throat with a bowie knife and leave them laying there on the ground. And how do you, so, how do you know that? Well, this is a matter of an historical record. Um, there are several famous uh, either Danites, the other group, which is very similar, is called the Avenging Angels. And um, some people like uh, Orrin Porter Rockwell, Wild Bill Hickman, not Wild Bill Hickok, these are, these are actual historical guys that were, that were right up at the very top of the early Mormon hierarchy, and they, they were as dangerous as any gunfighter, as any, you know, murderer, cutthroat, person that you might have found in the Old West, they'd cut your throat without a thought if Brigham Young told them to. So then both, at least I think, I know Hickman has written his um, memoirs, had written his memoirs before he died, so he put all that on paper. Okay. Well, that was in the past. Does mm -hmm. it have any significance today? Well, the fact that, as I've said, I and several other prominent people that are former Mormons have, uh, have had death threats, have had shots taken at us, have had people try to poison us, kill us, whatever. Uh, I have every reason to believe that the eventual angels are still out there. Of course, they aren't riding around on horses anymore with hoods over their faces. They, they now use more subtle methods. But yeah, they're, they're very real. Okay. Well, because of that, do you know any Mormons who've been afraid to leave the church because of this a blood atonement law? Well, yeah. And it's, it's not just the blood atonement law. Uh, we know Mormons who have gotten born again in, in Salt Lake City who work for the church in fairly high levels, but they dare not leave because they have very sensitive knowledge and the Mormon church knows they have very sensitive knowledge. Uh, also, they fear losing their families because a lot of times if you, you know, apostatize from the church by becoming a born-again Christian, your husband or wife, as the case might be, will divorce you. And, and do everything they can to take the kids away. And of course, in Utah, most of the judges are Mormon, and they're going to be sympathetic to the Mormon side of the case. So there's a lot of fear. And so many of these people are sort of like um, secret agents, if you will, for us behind enemy lines in the very highest levels of the Mormon hierarchy. Mm. And they function there, and they, like for example, they're the ones that got us that tax return of the Mormon leadership back in 19, I forget what year it was, but it was in the early 80s, and um, revealed that in fact the Mormon church hierarchy, the three guys makes like a, made in that year like $191 million. Three of them? Three of them. <gasps> so that's a pretty good salary for a church that has no paid clergy. Wow. What did you say? Wow. Now can you imagine 
if it came out, just splitting that by three, 191, I mean, let's just for the sake of, say, 60 million, can you imagine if it came out that, say, you know, the leadership of the whatever church, Protestant church, was making $60 million a year out of the free will offerings of its members? What an outcry there would be from the media. Wow. But not a peep. What happens to Mormon women if they don't take a subservient role? Well, I mean, you hesitate to generalize, but, but we have had at least two or three women come to us over the years, one when we were still Mormons, and my wife was functioning as a, a therapist and I was a Elders Quorum president, who told us that because she was an uppity Mormon wife who would not submit to the patriarchal authority of her husband, and, and because of that, uh, one night when she was home alone, the door to her kitchen burst open and in walked three Mormons and her husband. And one of the Mormons was a local Mormon physician who was a surgeon. And they threw her right down on the table, pulled down her pants, and right in front of God and everybody, they did some very serious violence to her private members. And she was told that's what you get for speaking out against the priesthood. Wow. And this is known as chastisement. That's the word that they use. And it is not, I'm not saying it happens all over the place, mm -hmm. but I'm saying it still does happen. And this, this woman was, you know, this was like, well, now it would be 20 years ago, but she was, you know, she was in her late 20s. So, I mean, it's not like this is ancient history. Right. And this comes from the fact that women are basically very much second-class citizens in the LDS church. And there's nowhere for her to go, of course. Well, no, because she was, at that time, she was in the deepest part of Mormon Idaho. Um, Idaho Falls, somewhere around in there, I forget exactly where, and, and everybody there was a Mormon. If you went to the social services agencies, they were Mormons. If you went to the police, they were Mormons. And you see, very much like the Masons, the Mormons will tend to cover up for their own misdeeds because the prophet has told them to. Wow. So, <laughs> kind of scary. Yeah, very scary. Very shocking. How wealthy is the Mormon church? Well, probably per capita, because it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's over 10 million members, I forget the exact number, but it's the wealthiest church in America, if not in the world. I mean, it owns just countless real estate things, uh, it owns many television stations, it owns many uh, public, so, you know, like public utilities, power stations, power companies in the, in the Rocky Mountains and the West Coast. Um, it is really, it, it's the only church in America that's in the top 50 of the Fortune 500 if it were a corporation like that was a profit corporation instead of a not-for-profit. So it's that wealthy. It would be in the top 50 most wealthy corporations in the world. Wow. So that's pretty wealthy. And only 10 million members. So when yes. they grow... Yeah, yeah. And of course their influence goes like right now there are at least that I know of four television stations uh, local TV affiliates around the country that are totally owned by the LDS Church. And that's why, oh, this is now 10 or 15 years ago, 60 Minutes did a rather unflattering report about how the Mormon Church had had somehow stolen this one LDS farmer, some guy out near Provo, Utah, and he had a bunch of, I think it was cherry orchards. And they managed to steal his orchards away from him. And he called up, you know, Mike Wallace or whatever, and they did a story about this. And within one week, CBS retracted the story. Because the Mormons owned at that time three or four CBS local affiliates. Mm. And they said they'd close down the affiliates if CBS didn't retract the story. Wow. So they have a lot of economic clout, especially in the West Coast. But, you know, even in the East Coast. For example, the Marriott Hotel chain is owned by Mormons. And, um, you know, that they're not, it's not owned by the Mormon church, but it's owned by a Mormon family. And they're, I mean, you see them everywhere. I mean, they're, they have the subsidiaries like the Fairfield Inn and so on. And, and it's J. Willard Marriott, who's like kind of the patriarch of that family, who basically helped build the $20 million Mormon temple in Washington, D.C. Hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does the Mormon church use mind control? Well, in a sense, yes. I mean, it's not like I don't want people to get images of people being strapped in a chair and having wires hooked up to their heads or anything, but, but from a very early age, children are taught to bear their testimonies. 
and what your testimony is in, in Mormonism, it's nothing like what it is in Christianity. Your testimony is basically, it's this little canned thing you reel off where you say, I bear you my testimony that, that Jesus is the Christ, that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God, that fill in the blank, whoever is the current prophet is a prophet of God, that the Book of Mormon is true, and that I love my wife or my mommy or my daddy or whatever the case might be, and then you can kind of elaborate from there. And this is drummed into them from the time that they're barely old enough to walk. So, I mean, I remember sitting there and, and seeing families get up there and having little, like, three-year-old kids get up there, you know, acting all cute and pointing, I bear you my testimony, you know, and they go off and say that stuff. Well, the result of this is, is that by the time these people, like, go out on a mission or something of that nature, when they're teenagers, you know, most Mormon missionaries are teenagers, um, it's like been drilled into the point that it's almost like this this program. And you'll notice if you ever like are in a conversation with a Mormon and you're, you know, kind of getting past their defenses and getting to the point where they don't really have answers anymore, which isn't that hard. And all of a sudden it's like you'll it's almost like you'll see this switch flip on inside of them and their eyes will sort of go glassy and they'll say, well, that might be, but I bear you my testimony that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God and that Gordon B. Hinckley is a prophet of God. And, you know, just, and I tell people at that point, just clap your hands and say, wait a minute, how do you know that? And they'll go like that, and they'll laugh like they've been awakened from a trance. Wow. And it's like at that point, you've gotten past the final gateway, you know, so to speak. And then they might be open to really hearing the truth. Because at that point, they won't know what to say. Because no one's ever done that to them, because it's considered very gauche to ever interrupt a Mormon when they're bearing their testimony. So you kind of knock them off their little their little program. The computer has to reboot. Hmm. <laughs> thank you. How fast is the Mormon Church growing? Well, the last I, I I don't keep up with it as much as I used to, but the last I heard is growing very fast in the third world. It's not growing very fast in America anymore. And that's partly because of the influence of films like The Godmakers and other Christian evangelistic and apologetic efforts. But overseas, believe it or not, it's growing fast in Africa, in spite of the fact that they have this very, very racist history and very racist theology. And, of course, part of the fact is, is that they simply grow by sheer reproduction. I mean, Mormons are, are very firmly encouraged to have large families. And so they, even if, even if they didn't convert another Mormon in this generation, it would still get bigger and bigger and bigger. But, I mean, the last, I mean, they, they grew like 100% in 20 years. They, I think they used to be like, you know, 5 million uh, at the time that we were members, and now they're 10 million. Mm. And grow, I'm sure it's more than that now. I mean, that was the last figure I happened to notice. But I'm, I'm more busy with other things now, so I don't really keep up on the latest census reports for Mormonism. Part of the problem, though, is, is that the Mormons never report when people leave. Ah. And they're leaving in droves. Oh, they are? Oh, yes. Oh, good. Yes. We get letters, and we're not even known as a, as a, as a, as a basic clearinghouse, but even so, we get like um, two or three letters or emails a year from people wanting out. And we're not, like I say, we're, we're one of the smaller ministries in terms of that. So Mormons are leaving. And if any of people are listening and they are Mormons and they want to get out, you have to write a letter to your bishop or your stake president and demand that your name be taken off the church rolls. It's not enough just to, just to walk away from the thing because those spiritual tendrils are still attached to you. And you need to renounce them and you need to send that letter and, and get and if you want you can contact our ministry, we'll give you a sample letter and how to leave the church. And with this blood atonement thing, is there any yeah. other security measures they should take? Well, Watch of course they ought to get born again if they're not. And it was Jesus and Yeshua as the best protector. But uh, I mean it's very rare. I would say there's like one chance in a hundred of someone getting blood atoned unless they're a very vocal opponent of the church. Right. And even then, if they're if they're if they just say, I want out of the church, I'm writing a letter, leave me alone, and they just go on their merry way, the the church will probably never bother them because they could not stand the bad publicity if it was found out they were running around shooting people or cutting people's throats that were trying to leave their church. Um, but, you know, it, it, and of course, it, like we just tell people, well, we're not worried about it because our dad can beat up their dad. What kind of security do the Mormon temples have? Well, first of all, as I think I mentioned earlier, a lot of a lot of there are a lot of Mormons in the FBI, the CIA, the Secret Service. So when those guys retire, 
they will often come and work for what is euphemistically called the church security system. And the church security system is the only church-related thing of its kind in the United States that has police power. In the state of Utah, they can arrest people. And, and these guys are also in charge of security around the Mormon temples. Um, so actually, I was told by an FBI, not an FBI agent, a Secret Service agent, a friend of mine who was a Mormon, that essentially, now this is of course long before 9-11, but that there was better security in the LDS Temple Square in Salt Lake than there was around the White House. Wow. There were, um, you know, machine guns hidden underneath the flower beds. There were laser, like, things at night to keep, you know, like laser sensors to keep people out of the place. And uh, I know one time when Ed Decker and I walked, we dared to walk onto Temple Square. And of course, Ed Decker is probably the most infamous anti-Mormon in the world. Uh, within five minutes, you could look up on the roof of the church security office building, which is a skyscraper across the street, from the temple, and you could see snipers up there with high-powered rifles pointing their <laughs> rifles at us, just in case we would do something weird, you know, like run and throw pig's blood on the wall of the temple and cry blasphemy or something. I don't know. And so they really have very good security around that temple. Well, few people would probably worry about the Mormon Church because they appear so nice, like you said, and they're called a bunch of saints, Latter-day Saints. So. Um, no one would really suspect anything, but here you've got an organization which is incredibly wealthy, gets up to 25% of money from its members, pays no taxes, has top security, has some rights which are similar to satanic rights, has killed its own members in the past, uses some kind of mind control, is growing rapidly, and has a goal to form a dictatorship. So this really should be front page headlines. Now, what could happen to the world if it did become a dictatorship? Well, I mean, first of all, it had to be just an American dictatorship at first, and then they think that it would spread. But, but they would basically, ideally, they would reinstitute what they call the United Order, which is a communistic form of, of government in which the church owns all property. And then the bishops of each ward are entitled to divvy out that property. And if you're not a Mormon, you're not part of that system. And it would be very much kind of like what you see in the book of Revelations where it says that you can't buy or sell unless you have the mark and the number of the beast because there'd be no way to get food except to toady up to the Mormons. And either you would have to, you know, you'd have to either be a Mormon or else somehow or other, you know, be in subservience to them. Uh, and again, mind you, most Mormons are very nice people, but the leadership of this church are very scary people. And I know I've met a few of them. And they, they have plans, and I think, I think a world under the, the benevolent dictatorship of the Mormon prophet would be a world with very little religious freedom, and a world with very little freedom for women, and probably a world where, because right now they're working on it. For example, in this state, Florida, they own almost, this is the last figure I heard, 90% of the farmland in this state. Of Florida? Yes. And they're chewing up farmland all over the Midwest. They're chewing up farmland all over the Pacific Northwest. They want to own all the farmland that they can in this country. They want to be control, in control of the food supplies of the United States. Wow! So, they, for example, they also own huge amounts of the, of the pineapple and other things in Florida. Because the Mormons are huge in Florida. So, you know... They have definite plans, and oddly and eerily enough, their plans are very akin to what you see that the, the Antichrist in the book of Revelations wants to do. Now, I'm not saying the Mormon prophet someday is going to be the Antichrist, but I'm saying that the, the, the devil sows many seeds, and that this might be you know, one of those seeds that he's sowing, and he hopes one of them bears its noxious fruit. And while they've got all this money and they own all the TV stations, most people will probably ne never get to hear about it. Well, exactly. That's why most, most TV and radio and other media outlets are, are very, between this atmosphere of political correctness where we don't really criticize anyone, unless, of course, they're a born-again Christian, uh, you know, you really get this thing where most people don't want to criticize a religion. And then on top of that, people fear the economic power of the Mormon church, you know. So it's, it's a real quandary, and people don't take them seriously enough because, as you say, they appear to be so nice. And, and, and again, 99% of them are wonderful people, but yeah, they're lost. Sure. And they need Yeshua. They need tr the true gospel of salvation by grace. 
What is voodoo? Well, voodoo is one of the one of the probably the biggest categories of what I mentioned earlier. Culture. It's called cultural spiritism in anthropology, and what it is, it's a kind of weird eclectic blend of African shamanism blended with Roman Catholicism. And it and basically came about because there were all these slaves brought over from Africa, and of course they brought their, their uh, native um, beliefs, their native shamanic beliefs to the Caribbean, to the uh, island of Haiti, and then the, the slave masters, of course, forced them to become Catholics. And so they blended the two. And the, the word uh, voodoo is very controversial in terms of its origin. Some people say it comes from an African word, vodun. Uh, some people say it comes from, um, I think it was Rabelais, the rather infamous French writer who came up with the term do what thou wilt. And it's in French, it's face que voudra which is sort of similar to voodoo. Uh, nobody really knows for sure where the word came from, it, but essentially it's a system where the, the main function of voodoo is that they, the devotees will come and meet on certain times, and they often correspond with Catholic saint days and, and Catholic festival days. And the goal is, is that they, they light candles, they create a, a sacred space, and, and then they'll put down what are called veves on the ground, which are like, like talismans done in, in like cornstarch or flour. And then they will like, you know, kill a chicken or some other small animal and sprinkle blood over themselves with all this dancing and drumming going on. And then the goal is to be ridden by a loa. Now a loa is like a demon god of voodoo. And they want to be possessed by that person. And when they get possessed, they have this ecstatic experience where they fall down on the ground sometimes, or they, they dance wildly, or they roll around on the floor and frot at the mouth. I mean, it sounds kind of like a charismatic meeting, doesn't it? <laughs> I shouldn't say that anyway. I mean, there's some <laughs> kind of weird charismatic groups out there, too, the snake handlers and all. But these people are doing it in the name of a false god. And the other part of it is, is that, of course, voodoo uh, does have ways of doing both white and black magic that are very powerful. So I think it's one of the most dangerous religions in the world. And it's not just practiced by black people, that's a common misperception. I was personally brought into the first three layers, if you will, of voodoo up to being a hungan, which is like a priest of voodoo. A priestess is called a mambo. And, uh, and that was done by a white man who was personally brought into it by the Pope of voodoo. So, you know, there are a lot of white people who practice voodoo because they believe it's a quick way to get power or a quick way to get money or to get ahead in their careers or whatever is by invoking the Loa. Why did you get involved in voodoo? Well, I was, from the time I got involved in, um, in Wicca and witchcraft and stuff, I was kind of, I'd read a couple of books and I was kind of intrigued by it. And then, um, then when I got involved with this fellow down in Chicago who had the room with the strange pictures and the strange plants that moved around, I found that he was also a voodoo hierophant. And so he said, well, of course, part of making you a Catholic bishop, we have to take you for, through the, the, the other two degrees of the early voodoo things that are lavate, which is like baptism, and then lingla swa, which means you have to eat a shroud. And those are, those are the two earlier stages. It's all involving the death and graveyards and things. It's very, very bizarre. And, uh, and that's why, is it partly I was intrigued by it, and partly I was intrigued by the way this fellow had blended voodoo and Catholicism and transyguthian magic in such a creative way. So that's why I got into it. Let's see. For how long were you involved in voodoo? Oh, I would say probably two or three years. Thank you. From your own experience, what can you tell us about voodoo? Well, it's... If you don't like drinking, you better not get into it. I don't like, I've never liked alcohol much. And, you know, there's a lot of drinking of rum. And, you know, you either use it as a sacramental substance or else you, you spit it out. And, you know, like holy water, you like swirl it around, around and spit it out. And, and it's, uh, my own personal experience was, it's, it's a very bizarre religion. It's a very uh, atavistic, bestial religion. You, it brings out, the the worst in people and also it is um it's a religion where you're encouraged to do that like like the fellow who was my immediate superior he was trying to encourage me to try to become a were tarantula to be able to turn into a, a spider 
a very ugly giant spider. Wow. And I never really wanted that, but uh, you know, fortunately, I kind of got away from. It. Also, there's a lot of of sexual stuff, both homosexual, heterosexual stuff going on, orgies, things of that nature. And they do this because in voodoo, they believe there's certain energy points around the um, private organs of the body, which are gateways into other universes. And if you can get into these other universes, again, we're back to the same thing, this archaeometry idea of, cre of drawing in power in which you can become a more powerful thing. And then, of course, there's the whole thing of cursing. I mean, the idea of the voodoo doll is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there's a very sophisticated level of cursing people and a very high level of power with it, which I must tell you, it's probably the most powerful way to curse someone is to use voodoo. And, and it, it's some of the most awful ways of dying. You do not want to, unless you're covered in the blood of the lamb, you do not want to run afoul of a voodoo mambo or a voodoo hungan because they can, like, you know, probably make your body devour itself from the inside out. Can you tell us a story to show people who think voodoo is a joke? Well, what can do? well I, 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 I may have mentioned this earlier, but there was this one person who ran afoul of the guy who was my teacher and uh, without going into all gory details, basically this fellow used a, a hex on him and uh, essentially the guy had, had scorpions and centipedes eating their way out of his stomach within three days. And he did died. people see them? And he died horribly in the emergency room. So yeah, they were real. So what did the people in the hospital think? They had no understanding. I mean, if you want to get an idea of what these religions are like, I don't encourage people to see this, but there's a movie out there called The Believers. It stars Martin Sheen. And it's about this guy that tries to fight a, a actually it's a Santeria type cult, but it's very much the same thing. Uh, another fellow literally, and I didn't see this personally, but I have no reason to doubt it, he literally had his skin turned inside out by a hung god. <gasps> you know, it killed him instantly, but he, he literally was laying there on the floor with his, his organs on the outside and his skin on the inside. And how do you know that that's what happened to him? Well, I don't know for sure. I didn't see it. Mm -hmm. But I, the guy that told me about it was a different fellow who was actually a police, not a police, a private detective mm -hmm. who was investigating a branch of voodoo that was in the Pacific Northwest. Wow. So, you know, without the protection of the blood of the lamb, you're, you're in kind of, and it's really funny because they'll call up, the voodoo people will call upon Jesus. They'll call upon the Virgin Mary. Except behind these, like the Virgin Mary, for example, she's a representative of the goddess of the sea, Erzuli. And, you know, you have Papa Nebo, you have Baron Samadhi. These are all the names of the great Loa. Baron Samadhi is the god of the cemetery. He's the lord of the dead. And, and all of them have their places, and you can sick them on people. They're like demonic overlords. And it's a very potent religion. And as you can see, it's a religion of the powerless because it was basically started by black slaves. Uh -huh. And it gave them hope underneath their brutal masters. And, and now it, and it offered them a way to have spiritual power. And, and the, the strange thing is, I don't know if you've heard about this, but before several, many years ago, Haiti was basically a voodoo dictatorship run by Papa Doc Duvalier. And he was a... Uh, a voodoo hungan, and he actually had an army that was called the Tonton Makot, and this army was made up partially of Zuvembis, zombies, and partially the senior people were actually uh, voodoo hungans, and and they ruled Haiti with 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 absolute fear and terror. And I had a, a friend who was a Baptist missionary who went down there and he tried to plant a church down there. And he says, "You have never seen people." who are just so utterly, utterly terrified right down to their bones of this man. Because it was believed this guy could just like flick his fingers and kill an entire family. You know, he was like one of the most mighty of all the voodoo people. And, you know, he had a real uh, hold on the island until he was driven off. And then for a while his son, Bibi Doc, reigned and he was sort of a moron. And um, then he got thrown out, and now they've got some other guy in there. But the, the island is still like 90% Catholic and 100% voodoo. Wow. You mentioned zombies. What are they? Well, that's one of the folklore things. The actual word is Zuvembi, but popularly called zombies. Uh, it's part folklore and part reality. The reality part of it is, is that there's apparently a plant down there in uh, Haiti that's native there that if you take the... 
extraction of it and give it to someone, it will appear to poison them and kill them. It will lower their heart rate, it will lower their respiration to the point they're almost indetectable except to the finest instruments. And the person gets buried. And they might be buried for three or four days and then they're dug up. And when they're dug up, they've lost most of their higher brain functions because of the drug and the loss of oxygen. So they're like, well, they're like a zombie. I mean, they'll do things if you tell them to do them, including kill people, fire guns at people, you know, strangle people, you know, wait on your hand and foot, whatever you, you know, they're, you know, they're very much like the classic image of the zombie, but yet they're alive. Have they're you ever seen dead. one? No, I have not. But from what I, I mean, there's actually anthropological books by scholars who've gone down to Haiti and who've studied this, and it's, and it's easy to see in a primitive people where there was not any real good medicine to tell whether this person who was laying there was really dead or not, mm -hmm. you know. And, uh, and, and, and of course this terrified the people because the guy would say, well, I can poison this man, I can turn him into a zombie, and then five days later here the guy is walking around, you know, like he, he has no soul. Because that's the definition of a zombie, is someone who has no soul. And, and they can be basically told to do anything they want. But of course they will die if you, if you, you know, shoot them with a gun, they'll fall over dead, or if you bring them with a club or something. But, you know, it was still a very, very scary thing to a people that was not, well, to this day, Haiti's like, you know, 10% literacy rate. Mm. And that's, of course, the fruit of Catholicism, you know, and the right. fruit of voodoo too, you know. But, so, yeah, that's, um, that's one of those things where it's part just, you know, scary folklore, but there is a nugget of truth in it. Yeah. What are the dangers of being involved with voodoo? Essentially, it's demon possession. I mean, if you, if you really are a serious practitioner of voodoo, you are inviting high levels of demon possession because when I was into this stuff, again, I was literally begging demons to come into me and ride me. That's the word that's used. And while, yeah, it's a very ecstatic experience, but the cost spiritually is so high. And the power that you might gain, and that's why a lot of people get into voodoo, they have this idea, oh, well, I can, you know, I, I see this cute girl at my workplace and I can make a voodoo doll of her and, you know, force her to fall in love with me and things like that. And, you know, it's kind of a juvenile way of looking at it, but the point is, is that that kind of power might be real to a degree, unless, of course, in the object of those spells is a Christian, but it comes at a terrible price because you're demon-possessed, you lose all, ultimately you lose all control of yourself, and... You know, you almost become a zombie, except that Satan is your master. Have you seen people that happen to? Well, I've seen people who were so thoroughly evil that they had no sense of humanity left in them that were involved in voodoo. People that just would, you know, they, they like, you know, literally eat a cat for lunch and think nothing of it, and the cat would be alive. And if you looked you into know, their eyes, could you see the person, darkness. the original person is still you, there? Not really, not much of them. It's like looking at her in the utter darkness or into, I, I, I call them ball bearing eyes, because it's like, in, like just eyes of steel, that there's, there's no humanity in there. And there probably is a human being trapped so far in there somewhere, just screaming to get out. And think of it, you would be spending 20, 30, 40 years of your life like that, trapped inside of a body that you could not control. I mean, it would be worse than being in a coma. Because right. at least the coma person just laying there sort of doing nothing. Here the body is doing things that you would find horrendous and not be able to stop it. Did that ever happen to you, that the demons in you did something you couldn't stop? Um, well, a few times, yes. I did some things that in retrospect I was very, very ashamed of. Um, nothing, you know, like killing anyone or eating a cat or anything. <laughs> but, you know, just, just like abusing people, being cruel and evil to people. Um, you know, uh, taking advantage of people, things like that. Okay. But nothing, you know, nothing really awful in the, in the, you know, legal sense of the word, thankfully. And you weren't fully into it like other people? No, no, I was that. not that far. I mean, I've only was used, as I said, I'd only been into it a couple of years, three okay. years at most, and then thankfully, you know, Yahweh started to get me out of that stuff. Okay, thank you. What advice would you give to people who know someone who's involved in voodoo? Well, I would say especially to just pray for them and I may have mentioned this before, but pray that the lying and deceitful spirits of the voodoo loa, it's spelled L-O-A, loa, would be bound from influencing that person and from giving that person power and pray that the spirit of truth would shower down on them from the Holy Spirit and then pray 
for like a divine appointment, for an opportunity for you to come up. Don't be afraid of these people. First of all, 90% of voodoo practitioners are not like wacko or dangerous or anything. They're, they're just people like you and me, you know. And then just pray for an opportunity to go and witness to them. And also, I think it's important to pray that Yahweh would lead someone else to them to witness to them who's a credible witness, maybe an ex-voodoo person, because there's a lot of them. There's a lot of people getting saved out of voodoo, just like there's a lot of people getting saved out of all these different groups. Okay, good. Now, when you say bind spirits, is it necessary they always do it in the name of Jesus or Yeshua? Well, I would say so, because <laughs> I don't. You see, we have no authority. Otherwise, it's like you know, uh, and I'm assuming the person we're discussing here is a Christian. Um, you know, otherwise you're like, you know, the thing in the Book of Acts where, you know, Jesus I know, but Paul I know, but who are you, you know? But we do have authority to bind and loose. And, but you need to use the name of Yeshua, we prefer Yeshua, as I said, or Jesus, uh, because that is the name which all demon spirits must obey. We've seen some of the most powerful evil spirits imaginable just buckle under the name of, which is above every other name, as the New Testament says. Thank you. And what advice would you give to people who think they've been affected by voodoo? Well, um, again, this is probably the most powerful kind of cursing that's out there, but it's still nothing compared to the power of Yeshua. So number one, get saved if you're not saved. Number two, be sure your, your house is cleansed, because a lot of this stuff works on the basis of object links. Like usually voodoo people, if they're going to curse you, They'll either get something from you or they'll throw something on your lawn. You might like find a dead bird with, with like a weird, you know, like a an, uh, ribbon around its neck or you might find like cross sticks or other things like that. Kind of walk your yard, reclaim your property for in the name of Yeshua, uh, plead the blood of the lamb over the property, over your house. Uh, also remit the sin of the shedding of blood of, of innocent blood over that part of the of the property uh, and then and then make sure your house is clean uh, and then just ask Yahweh to put a legion of angels around your house every night be sure you're walking you know righteously and not committing you know um, repeated sins uh, put on the armor of God every day and um, you know that should do it I mean those are things Christians should be doing anyway you know, whether you're being voodoo cursed or not, because we are in a war zone. You know, that's why Ephesians 6 talks about, you know, that we're warriors and we need to put on our armor every day, just like these guys over in Iraq. They have to put on their, their vests and their body armor and everything every day and their helmets before they go out into the enemy. And when you walk out the door of your house, you're walking into enemy lines, you know, because the world is lies and wickedness. Thank you.